In this video, hypothermia in canines will be explored with a focus on different causations of hypothermia, how to mitigate the risks of hypothermia occurring, pre- and post-operative care of a canine with hypothermia, and veterinary remedies for canine hypothermia. What is hypothermia? Hypothermia is categorised as an abnormally high raise in body temperature due to a malfunction of bodily mechanisms which regulate environmental heat. The causes of hypothermia can be varied and hard to establish. However, in canines, average core temperature is 38.3 to 39.2 degrees centigrade. So if core temperatures exceed 41 degrees centigrade and are accompanied with a dysfunctional nervous system, then hypothermia is determined. Heat stroke, heat fatigue and heat cramps are common versions of hypothermia. What are the causations of hypothermic reactions? Conditions conducive to hypothermia are raised environmental temperatures, general health and lifestyle. Significant environmental heat and humidity are common in hypothermia cases in canines and can be caused by weather conditions or being in an unventilated space, space such as a car. Health conditions can also play a role in developing hypothermia, with upper respiratory tract disease being one of the common attributing conditions. The upper respiratory tract consists of the nose, nasal passages, pharynx and trachea, so any disease or condition affecting these regions will influence the likelihood that a canine will contract hypothermia. Underlying diseases can also affect the likelihood of contracting hypothermia in canines, such as paralysis of the larynx, heart disease, blood vessel disease, and nervous system or muscular disease. If a canine has any of these ailments, an extra vigilance is recommended to reduce the risks of contracting hypothermia. Although there is limited empirical evidence and studies examining the pathological reasons for fatalities in canines, there has been a notable study conducted by Bruchim et al. on 54 dogs who died of hypothermia. The results of Bruchim's study concluded that the most prevalent lesions included hemorrhagic diathesis, microthrombosis and coagulative necrosis of various organ systems. Although the study has developed the groundwork for understanding and effectively assessing prognosis in hypothermia cases in canines, more empirical study needs to be undertaken to reduce the time of prognosis and increase the chance of a canine with hypothermia can survive, as the survival rate is currently around 50%. Poisoning can also be a source of hypothermic reactions, with traditional poisons such as strychnine and slug plate commonly sourced as causing seizures in canines which can then lead to an abnormal raising core temperature. Anesthesia complications have also been in attributed to cases of hypothermia, although this is an irregular occurrence. Brachiocephalic canines and the susceptibility to hypothermia. Brachycephalic canines are especially susceptible to hypothermia as their shorter and wider skulls make panting more difficult. Despite this fact, brachycephalic breeds are increasing in popularity with owners. Since 2007 there has been a 3,104% increase in acquisitions of French Bulldogs, 193% increase in Pug acquisitions and 96% increase in Bulldog acquisitions. This increase in brachycephalic canines will impact veterinary workload and poses an ethical question on whether continuous selective breeding of these animals to further change phenotype is detrimental to the welfare of the animals. Over the last 20 years there has been extended attention to brachycephalic breeds in the media and in scholarly articles. The consensus is that selective breeding of these animals seriously affects the welfare of brachycephalic breeds, most notably with brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome, which can be which can cause many issues including hypothermia that can be fatal. What should you do as an owner if your canine has suspected hypothermia? A veterinarian must be immediately contacted when a canine has suspected hypothermia and a meeting must be scheduled as soon as possible as timing is essential while treating hypothermia. The longer the animal experiences hypothermia without prolonged treatment, the more risk of fatalities occurring. The first response for owners of a canine experience suspected hypothermia is to conduct a primary assessment using the DRABC protocol. DRABC assesses the danger the animal is in, the responsiveness of the patient, whether the airways are open, 
assesses if the animal is breathing or not to determine if CPR is required and finally determines if the circulatory system is functioning to its normal capacity. This is where mucous membranes, capillary refresh times and heart rate all need to be evaluated to determine the severity of the condition. The secondary assessment is a full body check to ensure there are no irregularities in the animal's body composition. It is paramount in cases of hypothermia to slow, slowly reduce the canine's body temperature by means of convection or evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling is the canine's body, canine body response to overheating as they lack sweat glands. Air is breathing rapidly in the form of panting and as the air interacts with the mu mucous membranes of the upper airway then evaporative cooling takes place. Convection is a process of heat transfer from a hot or cold object so an overheated animal encountering a cooler surface will dissipate its heat to that surface. If the hypothermic reaction is occurring outside, moving the canine to a shaded area which is cooler can help mitigate the effects, while also finding cool water to pour over the animal or a cool wet towel to cover the animal will reduce temperatures. Cooling the canine too rapidly can cause hypoperfusion, which is the failure of oxygen circulation to tissues in the body. This would bring new problems along with the hypothermia and increased chances of fatality, so cold water must be avoided. Active cooling is the most vital stage in terms of mortality rates in canines with hypothermia. One study revealed that canines who were actively cooled prior to arriving at a veterinary clinic had a 19% mortality rate, compared to a 49% mortality rate in canines actively cooled after arrival. What is pyrogenic and non-pyrogenic hypothermia, and why does it matter? After the initial cooling of the canine, taking the animal to a veterinary practice is essential, and transporting the animal in an air-conditioned car is advised. Veterinary procedures may be needed to remedy any lesions, and monitoring needs start immediately upon arrival to the veterinary practice. Whether the canine has pyrogenic or non-pyrogenic hypothermia will determine which procedures may be needed. Pyrogenic hypothermia is more commonly known as fever and is an increase in the hypothalamus' set point due to any indigenous pyrogens or exogenous pyrogens being present in the body, such as cytokines expelled by cells of the immune system or antigens related to infections, which reduces the body's ability to regulate heat. A set point is the normal range that any biological function can reside in healthily. So in terms of temperature in dogs, that set point is 38.3 to 39.2 degrees Celsius. After cooling, active cooling of a, a canine with pyrogenic hypothermia can lead to metabolic stress, increased oxygen consumption and physical pain and discomfort. Therefore, active cooling needs monitoring even closer in the case of pyrogenic hypothermia. Pyrogenic hypothermia patients can also be exposed to forced air warming devices as these devices provide patients with better control and regulation of body temperature and are always deployed as methods for reducing core temperature as they are usually used for hypothermia cases. Excessive environmental heat or unfavorable environmental conditions for regulating heat such as unventilated spaces cause non-pyrogenic hypothermia and is more commonly, re commonly referred to as heat stroke. Non-pyrogenic hypothermia, unlike pyrogenic hypothermia, is not due to a breakdown of the body's temperature set point, so active cooling can be deployed more readily as a treatment method. How should you handle a canine for administration into a veterinary clinic? The leash is the most commonly used instrument for canine handling. When around a dog's neck, it has the ability to manage even the largest of dogs if the person managing the leash has enough strength. Carrying the canine is advised if the, by the owner if, poss if possible, as this reduces stress. Canines who are moved or handled in the clinic must wear a slip lead at all times. It is far too simple for a scared animal to break free and flee. Upon arrival to the veterinary clinic, a animals on a leash or collar should be moved to a slip lead and the leash should be given to a customer so that it does not become misplaced during the animal's stay. The general rule for restraining techniques for canines is the less restraint the better. Dogs that are aggressive may need muzzling or capturing by a dog catcher and put in a safe place until they can be administered into the veterinary clinic. What are the initial examinations that need undertaken upon arrival at the veterinary clinic? 
All hypothermia patients will need monitoring upon arrival of the veterinary clinic. Vital signs such as heart rate, temperature, mucous membrane colour, capillary refill time and respir respiratory rate all need monitoring. Blood pressure also needs monitoring with use of a Svigoma nanometer, which is a non-invasive way of detecting blood pressure. A cuff of the Svigoma nanometer is placed on the canine's paw or tail, and the cuff is inflated to increase the pressure exerted on the animal's limb and enabling a blood pressure reading. Canines usually become stressed with this procedure, so several blood, blood pressure measurements are taken to consider the increase in blood pressure from stress due to the procedure. The most common way to determine a canine's heart rate is to feel for the femoral artery pulse, which is located on the inner thigh of the rear leg, and it's easiest to find on the canine when he's standing, although this can be inaccurate and subject to human error. A normal heart rate range in canines would be around 80 to 120 beats per minute, with larger canines having slower heart rates, so determining the standard heart rate for each breed is needed before taking measurements. Heart rate in a veterinary clinic is usually determined with electro electrocardiography tests which needs to be implemented by use of an electrocardiogram which monitors the heart rhythms and determines whether there are irregularities. Taking the dog's rectal temperature is the only method to accurately determine if he or she has an elevated body temperature. The average temperature for a canine is 38.3 to 39.2 degrees centigrade and experts advise the use, the use of a digital thermometer designed particularly for rectal use in canines. Mucous membrane coloration also needs checking, with salmon pink being the most accepted colour for healthy gums. Although some animals have naturally blackened gums, therefore inside the eyelids can be used as another indicator. The presence of oxygenated haemoglobin in capillaries and vessels below the mucosal surface determines mucous membrane colour. Therefore, a lack of oxygenated haemoglobin will result in a pale colour and can be caused by blood loss, shock or kidney disease. Excessive amounts of oxygenated haemoglobin, however, will show up as a deeper red colour and can be caused by stomatitis, gingivitis or hypothermia. Capillary refill times can be more difficult to examine, as the explanation, examination depends on the experience of the person carrying out the procedure, along with the age of the animal and can be subject to human error. The canine's gum should be compressed and released, which should temporarily send the gum a whitish colour. The standard amount of time the, for the gum to return to its original colour should be 1.5 to 2 seconds approximately. Any deviation from this time scale could signal abnormalities with the animal's blood system. Capillary refill time must be used in a clinical setting and not for isolated examinations, as the physiological principles which determine peripheral perfusion are intricate, with many unknown factors affecting them. Lastly, respiratory rates need monitoring, but respiratory rates can be variable depending on the conditions of the animal or if they have been active or not. Due to this variability of respiratory rate, rest and respiratory rates need examining, and this can be taken while the canine is asleep or has been resting for at least 30 minutes. The most common way to take an animal's respiratory rate is to count how many times their chest contracts in 15 seconds and multiply the findings by 4. The average respiratory rate in canines is between 15 and 25 breaths per minute, so exceeding the average or having lower than 15 breaths per minute is an indicator of respiratory complications. What needs doing post-operatively for canine hypothermia patients? Although surgery is rarely required for hypothermia cases in canines, there are many different treatments that are required depending on the severity of the condition and whether the condition was pyrogenic or non-pyrogenic. Cool intravenous fluids that are the temperature of the canine's natural body temperature may be administered into the canine system by a catheter which would help with the active cooling of the patient and assist with thermoregulation. If hypothermia is pyrogenically induced in canines, then antibiotics are almost always required as they fight the viral infection by preventing bacteria from building cell walls and stopping their reproduction. Any forms of hypothermia in severe cases could cause anemia due to the damage of cells that carry oxygenated blood around the body. If cell damage does happen, then either blood transfusions or plasma transfusions may need administering, so access to frozen plasma or blood is crucial in this instance. An IV will be put in for the blood transfusion after preliminary testing to confirm the canine is a match with the donor haemoglobin. If the catheter is already in place, a second line will be inserted to verify the haemoglobin is the only thing moving through the line. 
Blood transfusion is beneficial in replenishing blood cells that are miss missing due to anemia and reducing the symptoms induced by that blood loss in canines. The effects of transfusion are temporary and only continue as long as red blood cells are present in the system. It is crucial to treat the underlying cause of anemia in order to have a better long term impact on health. Plasma transfusions are platelet transfusions of two related transfusion treatments. These extra transfusions can enhance the critical blood products like clotting factors and platelets and they cannot be used for a substitute for a blood transfusion. Other treatments that could be administered depending on the medical history of the canine or predisposed conditions include anti-vomiting drugs, anti-diarrheal drugs and anti-seizure drugs. In conclusion, the main attributing factors of a successful first aid on a canine hypothermia case includes employing active cooling as early as possible in pyrogenic hypothermia cases, but also in non-pyrogenic cases, just with more vigilance. Establishing how severe the hypothermia case is with extensive examinations and a successful triage of the patient is vital. Ensuring the canine is routinely checked for vital sign changes mitigates the chance of any further issues arising from hypothermia.